welcome everyone to the Concord Bookshop and to our, I want to say we're nearing the end of our winter author series because I really want spring to be coming, so um, we've got a few more weeks and we are thrilled um, that you're here today in Out of the Cold and we're very happy to welcome you and to welcome Susan Minot with her new novel, 30 Girls. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Um, the novel springs from a horrific real event the 1996 kidnapping of 139 girls from their Catholic school in Uganda. The perpetrators were members of the Lord's Resistance Army, which is a rebel group headed by Joseph Koenig. Minot fictionalizes the event, and she adds a second storyline centered around Jane, an American journalist who is sent to, or actually sends herself to interview some of the girls after their escape a year later. There's a uh, sharp contrast of haves and have-nots in this. There are remarkable scenes, um, beautiful landscapes where unspeakable acts take place. They startle the reader um, who gets to see both sides of this Ugandan coin in this novel. 30 Girls is called by NPR extraordinary, panoramic, poetic, and the New York Times says it's a novel of quiet humanity and probing intelligence. Minot takes huge questions and examines them with both a delicate touch and a clear-eyed, unyielding scrutiny. Susan Minot is a graduate of Concord Academy. She earned her MFA from Columbia. She's an award-winning novelist, short story writer, poet, and screenwriter, dividing her time between New York City and an island off the coast of Maine. Please help me welcome Susan Minot. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to give you a little background uh, about the writing of the book before I read from it, because sometimes I think it's hard to listen to someone read for a long time. <laughs> Easier to talk. Um, Sixteen years ago, I went to a dinner party. That, that was the seed of this book. And if I hadn't gone to a dinner party, I wouldn't have written this book. Um, I went, it was, uh, some friends of mine were hosting some human rights watch groups that were doing a big banquet the next day. And so it was sort of a more informal gathering. And there was a woman there um, from Uganda. She was in her early 40s and very sort of relaxed with dimples and, uh, you know, wearing a nice kind of loose, patterned African dress, and at the end of dinner, um, everyone sort of turned their attention to her, and she told a story about um, a Catholic boarding school in the north of Uganda, where, run by Italian nuns, that was um, attacked, actually it was Independence Day, it was Uganda's Independence Day, like our 4th of July, and some guards that should have been posted there at the gates were off getting drunk and celebrating. So this group of bandits, I would, even though they are called, as, as my introducer said, uh, Lord's Resistance Army, they are really more of a pack of bandits. They're, they're not like a rebel group trying to truly overthrow the government. Um, they stormed the dormitory and led out um, 139 <coughs> girls into the night and the um, one of the Italian teachers a nun named Sister Raquel as dawn was coming up she said well, we have to go and get we must go get our girls and she went with one of the teachers and chased after them through the bush um, it's a very poor agrarian um, landscape and people travel by paths and they would find little you know, someone's sweater that had been dropped, and they followed the trail. And um, I'm not going to tell the rest of that story. I'm going to read my fictionalized version of it to you. But at the dinner party, everyone sort of, you know, stopped and didn't really say anything. And and some, and the woman, whose name was Angelina, said, and the reason I'm telling the story is because one of those girls is my daughter. Charlotte, and she is with the rebels. Now, this has happened a year and a half before, and I'm here to try to get attention to this problem. And everyone, of course, silence. It was horrible. And someone said, do we know about this? 
which was obviously a question she couldn't answer. <laughs> but the answer was that no, we didn't know about that, that um, I'd done up till then. And I thought, you know, maybe I can write about this if this isn't something that we uh, know about. And I was, I had a trip planned in a couple of months. I was going back, so I organized to write about this this particular story and to find out about what was happening to these children, um, tens of thousands of which were being kidnapped, taken out of their huts. You know, very poor. Um, kind of villages, parents would be killed, they'd enslave the children, make them kill other children so they wouldn't be able to return, they would feel scared about trying to escape. But they did escape a lot because it was a really kind of slipshod operation. The trap moved around a lot, there wasn't one big camp, they crossed the border into Sudan. and So many children had not only been abducted but had escaped and come back needless to say, traumatized. Um, the girls were made to be wives to the rebels, they had children, they caught AIDS. I mean, it's just such a disaster. But they were children, they're in a poor area of Africa, and there wasn't any real, except from a humanitarian, you know, political point of view, for anyone to do anything about them. Anyway, I, I, I went there not as, you know, sort of a hardcore proper journalist um, and met, went to the area, went to the, the school, I met with Sister Raquel, I heard her tell her story, I met a lot of the children um, and wrote a story. And uh, it was published and I never heard a peep about it. Um, <clears throat> now when I write a book, I don't expect to hear a peep about it. <laughs> I write fiction sort of in the spirit that I read it, which is that of a stranger I happen upon who has sort of, that is the author that I'm reading, um, put out some story that I share with her or him. And I think when I first started reading and particularly fell in love with literature, which happened to be in this town where I went to school, um, it was one of the things that inspired me to want to write. I thought, I want to do what these writers are doing for me. But this piece that I wrote about the, the <coughs> girls of St. Mary's of a bouquet, I actually wanted someone to respond. It was something, it was something that needed to be uh, addressed. So I was disappointed, but life went on. I thought, well, I guess this is what it's like to be a journalist, and, and uh, I, I didn't attempt any other things like that, not out, out of discouragement, but I I was doing other things, I was writing screenplays, and and when it, I took some time off um, writing books, I had a daughter, and that took up a lot of time, um, but when, about uh, seven years ago, I, I thought, well, it was really time to write a book, partly for artistic reasons, but I think it's safe to say more for financial reasons, which as Samuel Johnson said is the only reason anyone should write. Um, I had those girls just there in front of my face. I felt like I hadn't really told their story. And I thought, well, you know, the, the fiction writer's realm um, certainly is the interior life of a person. So I thought, well, maybe I can try to write their story from this other angle. And I thought it would take me sort of two or three years, which is how long my other books had taken, 
but after three years, I was still very much in a tangle with it, and then four, five, six, seven, anyway, it took seven years to write, so it took a while to write, um, for a number of reasons, but I finally did. <laughs> so, I'm going to read you first the end of that story. Um, I, again, fictionalize it, so the Sister Raquel of real life is Sister Julia in this story, though Coney is still referred to by his evil um, name, which should not be let off any kind of hook. So she's, <clears throat> she's going after the girls. It's about noon by the time she looks across a valley and she sees probably 20 or 30 rebel soldiers and all the girls tied up with, with ropes around their waists. And, and she, you know, with sort of trepidation, approaches and uh, they are not, um, she's welcomed by the commander who holds up his rosary and says, you, you come, come, come sit with me. So they, she walks along with them for a long time. After several hours, they came to a wooded place with huts and round burnt areas with pots hanging from rods. It looked as if farther along there were other children and other rebels. She saw where her girls were led and allowed to sit down. Captain Legira brought Sister Julia to a hut and sat there on a stool. There was one guard with a gun who kept himself a few feet away from Legira. This rebel wore a shirt with the sleeves cut off and a gold chain and never looked straight at Legira, but always faced his direction. He looked like he was about 13. He stood behind now. During the walk, she and Legira had talked about prayer and about God, and she learned that his God had some things not in common with her God but she did not point this out. She thought it best to try to continue this strange friendship. Would Sister Julia join him for tea and biscuits? Captain Laguerre wanted to know. She would not refuse. A young woman in a wrapped skirt came out, of, out from the hut, carrying a small stump for Sister Julia to sit on. It was possible this was one of his wives, though he did not greet her. At the edge of the doorway, she saw a hand and half of a face looking out. Tea, he said. The woman went back into the hut and after some time returned with a tray and mugs and a box of English biscuits. They drank their tea. Sister Julia was hungry, but she did not eat a biscuit. I ask you again, she said, will you give me my girls? She didn't phrase it as a question. He smiled. Do not worry, I am Mariana Laguira. He put down his mug. Now you go wash. Another girl appeared, this one a little younger, about 20, with bare feet and small pearl earrings. She led Sister Julia behind the hut to a basin of water and a plastic shower bag hanging from a tree. She must have been another wife. Sister Julia washed her hands and face. She washed her feet and cleaned the blisters she'd gotten from her wet sneakers. She returned to Mariano. This rebel commander was now Mariano to her, as if a friend. He still sat on his stool, holding a stick and scratching in the dirt by his feet. She glanced toward the girls and saw that some of them had moved to a separate place to the side. Mariano didn't look up when he spoke. There are 139 girls, he said, and traced the number in the dirt. That many, she thought, saying nothing. More than half the school. I give you, he wrote the number by his boot, as he said, 109. And I, he scratched another number, keep 30. Sister Julia looked toward the girls with alarm. There was a large group on the left and a smaller group on the right. While she was washing, wa while she was washing they had been divided. She knelt down in front of Mariana. No, she said, they are my girls. Let them go and keep me instead. Only Coney decides these things. 
and let me speak with Kony. No one ever saw Kony. He was hidden over the border in Sudan. Maybe the government troops couldn't reach him there. Maybe, as some thought, President Museveni did not try so hard to find him. The North was not such a priority for Museveni, and neither was the LRA. There were government troops, yes, but the LRA was not so important. Let the girls go and take me to Kony. You can ask him, he said, and shrugged. Did he mean it? You can write him a note, Captain Laguerre called, and a woman with a white shirt and ragged pink belt was sent to another hut to return eventually with a pencil and piece of paper. Sister Julia leaned the paper on her knee and wrote, Dear Mr. Coney, please be so kind as to allow Captain Mariano Laguerre to release the girls of a bouquet. Yours in God, Sister Julia De Angelis. As she wrote each letter, she felt her heart sink down. Coney would never see this note. You go write the names of the girls there, he said. She looked at the smaller group of girls sitting in feathery shadows. Please, Mariana, she said softly. You do like this, or you will have none of the girls, he said. She left the captain and went over to the girls sitting on the hard ground. She held the pencil and paper limply in her hand. The girls looked at her, each with meaning in her eyes. She bent down to speak. Girls, be good. But she couldn't finish her sentence. The girls started to cry. They understood everything. An order was shouted, and suddenly some rebels standing nearby were grabbing branches and hitting at the girls. One jumped on the back of Louise. She saw them slap Janet. Then the girls became quiet. Sister Julia didn't know what to do. Then it seemed as if they were all talking to her at once in low voices, whispering. No, not all. Some were just looking at her. Please, they were saying, sister, take me. Jessica said, I have been hurt. Another, two sisters, my two sisters died in a car accident and my mother is sick. Charlotte said, sister, I have asthma. Sister, I am in my period. Sister Julia looked back at the captain, standing with his arms crossed. He was shaking his head. She said she was supposed to write their names, but was unable. Louise, the captain of the football team, took the pencil from her, from the paper, and started to write. <coughs> Akela, Esther, <coughs> Ochiti, Agnes, Judith, Helen, Janet, Lily, Jessica, Charlotte, Louise, Jacqueline. Did I mistreat you, sister? No, sir. Did I mistreat the girls? No, sir. So next time when I come to the school, do not run away, the captain laughed. Would the sister like more tea and biscuits? No, thank you. They bade each other goodbye. It was as if they were old friends. You may go greet them before you leave, Mariana Laguerre said. Sister Julia once again went over to the 30 girls, her 30 girls, who would not be coming with her. She gave her rosary to Judith and said, look after them. She handed Jessica her own sweater out of the backpack. When we go, you must not look at us, she said. No, sister, we won't. Then a terrible thing happened. Catherine whispered, sister, it's Agnes. She has gone just over there. Sister Julia saw Agnes standing back with the larger group of girls gathered to leave. You must get her, Sister Julia said. She couldn't believe she was having to do this. If they see one is missing, so Agnes was brought back. She was holding a pair of sneakers. She was told she might be endangering others. Okay, Agnes said. I will not try to run away again. Sister Julia had to make herself turn to leave. Helen called after her, Sister, you are coming back for us? Sister Julia left with the large group of girls. They walked away into the new freedom of the same low trees and scruffy grasses, which now had a new appearance, and left the 30 others behind. Bosco led the way, and Sister Julia walked in the middle. Some girls walked beside her and held her hand, 
They bowed their heads when she passed near them. Arriving at a road, they turned onto it. The rebels stayed off the roads. It grew dark and they kept walking. They came to a village that was familiar to some of them and stopped at two houses to spend the night. There were more than 50 girls to each house, so many lay outside, sleeping close in one another's arms. Sister Julia felt she was awake all night, but then somehow her eyes were opening and it was dawn. At 5 a.m. they fetched water and continued footing at home. As the birds started up, they saw they were close to the school and found that word had been sent ahead and in little areas passed people who clapped as they went by. Sister Julia felt some happiness in the welcome, but inside only distress. They came finally to their own road and at last to the school drive. Across the field, Sister Julia caught sight of the crowd of people near the gate. The parents were all there waiting. She saw the chapel blackened with soot behind the purple bougainvillea with the tower above still standing. Many girls ran out to embrace their mothers who were hurrying to them. As she got close, Sister Julia saw the parents' faces watching, the parents still looking for their daughters. They searched the crowd. There was Jessica's mother with her hand holding her throat. She saw Louise's mother, Grace, ducking side to side, studying the faces of the girls. The closer they got to the gate, the more the girls were engulfed by their families, and the more separated became the adults whose children were not there. The families held each other and kept their attention away from the parents whose girls had been left behind. They would not meet their gaze. In this way, those parents learned that their children had not made it back. When they came near Sister Julia and all the commotion, she turned away from them. She was answering other questions. Some mothers were kneeling in front of her, some kissed her hand. She was thinking only, though, of the <clears throat> other parents. And she would talk to them eventually, but just now it seemed impossible to face them. Then she wondered if she'd be able to face anyone again, ever. So in the book, we follow the stories of two different people, characters. Um, one is, is Jane, the American writer, um, and one is a Ugandan girl, nearly 16, who was one of, the, one of those 30 girls um, who was with the rebels for a couple of years and escaped and is at the start of the book in a rehabilitation center where she's hopefully being kind of treated. I'm going to give you just a tiny, just a page of Jane, and then I'll give you a little of Esther. This is so to tell the state of mind that Jane's in when she arrives in Africa. She stepped out of the plane and over the accordion, accordion hinge of the walkway to continue up the tunneled ramp. One always felt altered after a flight. There was the pleasant fatigue of no sleep and one's nerves closer to the surface as if a layer of self had peeled off and gotten lost in transit. The change was only on the surface, but the surface was where one encountered the world. Her surface was ready for the new things that would happen in this new place, ready for anything different from what she'd known. There was a soggy tobacco smell at the gate and loose rugs with long rolls no one had bothered to smooth out. She stood in the line of crumpled people, holding their carry-ons and inching forward to wooden tables where clerks slowly stamped passports after a sliding look from the picture to the face. She was finally away. She couldn't remember the last time she'd felt the expansion, the air humid, the door opening. Dawn light reflected off a hammered linoleum floor as she descended an old-fashioned staircase to the black carousel, empty of baggage. There was a long row of bureau de change with one short counter after another empty, and behind them a large plate glass window with palm trees being eaten by a white sky. 
Lackadaisical drivers were leaning on the hoods of their cars, half glancing around for a fare. Dark-haired men strolled in short-sleeved shirts. Women in thin dresses moved slowly. Everything mercifully said, this is not home. We hear directly from Esther instead of about Esther. I sit among the girls in the shade of a tree not so far above my head. It is peaceful with their voices in the air, talking quietly. It might be bird song for all I understand or care. I think I will never be close to anyone again. We are just now supposed to be drawing pictures of things we would like to forget. You can see why this is strange. We must think, in order to draw them, about those terrible things we would rather remove from our minds. We are told that drawing such things will help us remove them. Instead, I am drawing the tree past the work shed toward the field. It has a curved trunk and resembles a woman twisting to look over her shoulder. Today I woke with a pressure on my eyes, pulling my forehead. I thought, perhaps I'm getting a cold. Maybe I am. My mind is uneasy. Since being away, I am used to my thoughts being disrupted. They have cracks in them. I remember in a soft way, as in the distance, how it was to be whole. Nothing. It was like nothing. You just had wholeness. We did not feel it. I would not have known it was there if I had not become as I am now. It has offered me perspective. It is interesting how one can understand a way that one was only after one is another way. <clears throat> Beside me, the girls' heads are bent close to the paper. They use ballpoint pens and pencils, which are better if you want to erase. Red pencils are often used for the blood and the bullets. At night, the bullets were red. Polly is beside me. She leans on a cardboard cracker box. She has drawn a house with a thatched roof and doorway, her house. Soon she will add men with pangas, a chair on fire, and her loop broken on the ground. She was practicing music when she was taken. Polly's from the country near Ongoko, not from the town like me. I am from Lira town, which is not far just a day's walk. Past the picnic bench near the shop, the boys are together, they're drawing. I see that one, Simon, with them. His back is to me with his bad legs straight out. When he was shot, the bullet was near the bone, so his knee is not so good. He swings his foot around when he walks instead of stepping straight. The scar looks like a crack in a window with jagged lines coming out from a shiny pink center against his dark skin. The scars on us are not straight. Simon is good at drawing, so his drawings are tacked up in the bicycle repair. He's skillful at details, doing three shades of camouflage with one lead pencil. One is of a car with fire, flames smaller than the smoke. One of a boy with his arm cut off and drips of blood making a puddle. His AK-47s shoot clouds and the soldiers have bouffant hairdos and sideburns, as in <coughs> cartoons. Everyone draws them that way, even though they do not so much look like that. They look like anyone. Our camp is called Kiryandongo Rehabilitation Center, and we are, during the dry season, a dusty circle cleared in the middle of tangled bush a little ways off the Gulu Road. There are some huts in the office and two sheds where Charles, our head counselor, has an office. The kitchen has a small roof and all sides open to the fire pit and brick oven, and there you see Francis cooking. Chickens peck around. We had chickens when I, when I was small, and I liked to hold them as pets. They were nervous, but if you keep patient, they will calm down and stay in your lap, even if their eyes are startled. In the work shed is a shop for making instruments and building chairs and repairing bicycles. Behind in the trees is a large white tent that came from Norway where the boys sleep. The <clears throat> ventilation is not so good 
and having sixty boys inside, the air is unmoving and hot. The girls sleep in dormitories with bunk beds so close you can reach over and touch the girl next to you. Holly, in the upper bunk beside me, has decorated her area with strings dangling empty boxes of close-up toothpaste or fortified protein. I have no decoration. Underneath Holly is May, who is very pregnant, due in a month. Her parents do not accept the child coming and have not visited May. At Kiriandongo, we are all united by a thing that also divides us from others. We look at each other and know what we've been through. We also look away for the same reason. Since my return, I meet new challenges of the mind. I have decided to forget everything that happened to me there, and so look forward to the remainder of my life. I am not so old, nearly 16. My life could still be long. Before my life was nothing to speak of, you would not have heard of it. Now they tell us it is important to tell our story. They have us draw to tell it, but I am not so good at drawing. I have been back about two weeks. The days are strange. I am not used to the peace. I am not used to waking without someone hitting my feet. The first week I slept a great deal and woke with swollen eyes, which in the mirror had dark hoops under them. There's a heaviness in me where gladness does not reach. I know there should be gladness that I have returned. I am free, but gladness does not come to me. When they ask us to speak, I cannot say the words. What I have inside is for me to look at alone. Who else can know it? Not anyone. I cannot say it out loud. How can one tell a story so full of shame? I listen to the others talk and understand how they struggle. We knew the same things. I stay apart to keep, to make peace with it inside myself, if I am able. With the rebels, I learned that inside is where it most matters in any case. The boys finish their drawings, then get up and kick around a ball in the dusty field. Boys forever like to play with balls. This is better than hitting each other. Simon is running with his bad leg. Charles claps his hands, getting them to go faster. Here at Kiriandongo, they always want you to join in. They say, come on, I know you can run. Come on, get up off your seat. I prefer to sit. When the ants come, I brush them away. If they keep coming back to me, I pinch them between my fingers. Maybe I will get up when I'm ready. Maybe I will not. I hate everyone. I am one of the abducted children. Did I tell you my name? I am Esther Akin. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> do you have any questions? Thank you. I was just going to ask, I, I've read Monkeys and Evening, and um, this one just seems so different. I mean, those were kind of autobiographical. Was this real hard for you to write because it wasn't so much, you know, things from your life, or was it a whole different um, process? I'll let you in a secret. Very much, I felt I drew on my life to write this book. Hmm. Um, in the most sort of the widest sense of the word, which is, what is it like to be traumatized? What is it like to feel you don't think you can cope with something? Um, so I was really focusing on, even though, yes, the terrain of the story is, is a foreign one, mm -hmm. i.e. not one that I know as well as I know New England. Um, the terrain of the psyche, I would say, that we all share is um, not a foreign one. You know, I, I, I don't purport to know what it's like to be enslaved and raped repeatedly and <laughs> made to kill people. Um, but I think if I think people can 
we know what it's like to be alive, we know what human experience is like, we are able, with our imaginations, to fathom it. So, yes, I did push further into another place to fathom something that wasn't so directly. <coughs> um, yeah, let's hope one keeps on pushing oneself, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, I've, I've read the book um, and kind of immersed myself in it um, as I read it. Um, I was fascinated by a couple of things and wondered, um, the, the second story is about Jane. And, you know, very simply, I wondered about your, your choice of the name, which is kind of, kind of for me, evokes Dick and Jane, and something very simple, something very blank, um, and yet she's a very complex character, and um, she travels with a group of expatriates um, who, um, uh, it's, the story is um, in the here and now, as opposed to being what is and I just will and for, and a story of something a little more recognizable right. to us as readers, right? right? She's an American it's traveling mm -hmm. with sort of free spirits. Um, she's privileged. She has, you know, she's a, a part of the culture that we recognize. Esther is from a world that seems very, very far from us, and in many ways it is. Um, but I wanted to, you know, Esther's story is, you know, in kind of a knee-jerk reaction way, much more profound. I mean, it is more profound. Um, to not know if you're going to live or die every day has a certain kind of <laughs> intensity to it. Um, and so she <coughs> is struggling with things, you know, she doesn't have a choice. She's literally enslaved for, you know, she has this experience. She is made to kill another little girl. Um, so Jane is not dealing with those same struggles, but I wanted to partly to relieve the reader because <laughs> you it's, it's sort of hard to press a, a book in someone's hand and say they cut off your lips <laughs> and everyone's raped and you know but you got to read it you got to find out um, you know I it is a story I wanted to for people to know but people can only take so much I mean I took out a lot more things based on you know, the horrible things that happened there, that a little goes a long way, you know, to, to make the point. But I thought, so have the relief just in the narrative of someone um, who's not dealing with really this sort of intense evil, but, her own struggles. but is also struggling, you know, she's not a happy-go-lucky girl. And her struggles are um, intense for her. And uh, she's trying, um, even though you can look and say, oh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I see it in, I teach college students and writing classes. And, and often they'll, they'll write things that are on, you know, first glance more profound than their own experience might be because they'll say well my problems are stupid you know they're not uh, as important as as people who are you know living in poverty or that's true on a logistical level but on a human level I don't think that is true I think each person's struggle is just as valid really as another's so you know it was a, a risk to try to put them side by side because, and I, and I think I'm sure what well, people have told me in their reading experience, they're much more tracking with one story than another for whatever reason. 
they think it's more important or one's too hard to read and so they but um, hopefully by the time you've been with both of the characters by the end of the book you realize that these are two <coughs> people struggling with some of the things that are even the same even though their lives are so different um, for me, your writing is, a, is an important thing, your style and your... Writing your is the important thing because that's what this is made out of, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, thank you. You described it very well. I should take you with me. <laughs> so, I'm a big fan. I'm looking forward to reading yes. this. Um, how do you feel now that you struggled through, written it, it's done? And what are your hopes for it? Relieved. <laughs> Just on a daily level, I'm relieved. Um, I would say my hopes for it have been met. Um, there have been enough people who have said to me, this is very moving. Um, this is a story I didn't know about that I want. I mean, I feel like if it stopped now, I would feel satisfied. You know. Uh, on a practical level, catching <coughs> Coney, you know, he's he's barely active now. Uh, I'm not a big person that feels like getting him to justice is going to in any way help these people. The um, the children, <coughs> the abducted children, uh, you know, some 10,000 of them need help, certainly. So for them to get help in their kind of recovery... Um, that would be that would be good thing to happen. Yeah. You said this took you so much longer than it usually does to take to write a book. Would, could you tell us more about that? Well, I I, I always I, it's my first book in twelve years, and I have a daughter who's twelve, <laughs> and I often say, you know, my first book in twelve years, and Ava's twelve. And one, one point I was saying it to someone, and I heard from the other end of the room, she goes, stop blaming me. <laughs> You're right. I shouldn't blame her. You know, it wasn't her fault that it took that long. But it, it definitely was um, before I was a mother. It doesn't even have to do before I had a child. Before I was a mother, I had um, my time was I could disappear for periods of time. And as a mother, I, I can't do that. So that interrupted the, the process a lot. Um, I also, just um, for the, the content of the book, I wrote a lot more than ended up getting into the book. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of time writing in big different directions. You know, I was gonna try to follow more of the girls, each one of their stories. Of the, of the abducted girls so you could see how each one, you know, three or four of them, to see how each one coped with trauma because that was one thing I really wanted to look at in the book. Um, and it just, it, it was too much, you know, it was too much. Yeah? So did, has it had an impact? I mean, it sounds like it has. I don't know when the book came out. Um, just, it just came out a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Yeah. So, so as far as the practical Ugandan, don't know. Yes. Yeah. Don't know. And has your life been more involved with that that cause? As a, well, as I um, I feel like my involvement has been seven years of thinking about it every day. So that's been my involvement till now, mm -hmm. and now it's you know we we shall see. Yeah, can't imagine. I'm, I'm not gonna forget about them now. <laughs> yeah, there are. I mean, I I I am going to prepare. This is my first. These are my first few readings that I've done in the last couple of days. This is my third reading or something, and I realize I need some practical response for people about what can we do. Is there something we could do? I mean, if anyone is at all, you know 
familiar with the internet, you can figure it out. Mm -hmm. But it would help if I had, you know, you can go to St. Mary's of Aboke, girls, you can go rehabilitation centers for abducted children in Uganda. And there are plenty of, of sites and organizations where one could, which is the way to help donate money. Yeah. So did you talk with um, these young women from an interpreter? Um, some of them, uh, most of them spoke, the ones in the, uh, the, the girls from St. Mary's, um, there were, at the time I was there, I think only four of them had escaped of the, of the 30, and they spoke English. Huh. Yeah, the, the, the St. Mary's school was, even though, um, cause there are a number of different languages that they speak in the North, they speak lore, they speak a book, uh, um, I can't even remember the other one. Uh, but the, the nuns spoke English and all the children spoke English. So English was that. Yeah. Can, can you let us in at all about you know, your publisher's thoughts about making this book um, approachable or you know, any, any thoughts they had about you know, tackling the topic? Um, no. I couldn't tell you anything about that. Um, my publisher's thoughts. Uh, my, I can tell you that I have a um, editor um, at Knopf, which is where it was published, who was very, she, she happens to be a really good friend of mine, I don't know which came first, the editor of the friendship, who was, was very supportive um, all along um, as I was writing the book. Uh, I remember feeling like just in a sort of practical way, about two years ago, there was a, um, a video about Joseph Kony that sort of went famously viral. It was made by, I can't remember the guy's name, he has a group called um, Innocent Children. And he made this, this, he, like me, heard the story and was just so amazed, why doesn't anyone know about this? So he made a, a, a video, a kind of, 11 minute video that that was very kind of I want to say simplistic but it gave a simple view of this it had a lot of kind of um, attention grabbing sort of technique in it and a lot of young people saw it and told their parents about it that anyway it was do you know who this guy Joseph Coney is and after two weeks I think something like, you know, 400 million people had seen it, like it went, and it, it actually became more famous for, number one, a video going viral, people finally heard this man's name, and also that the, the, the sort of earnest guy who had made it was so attacked for getting some facts wrong and for whatever. He had 400 million people with an opinion, or you know, and, and the ones that were gonna give him their opinion weren't the supportive ones, that he sort of had a psychic break and kind of went crazy. It was like running naked through the streets oh and God. hospitalized and some poor guy. Yeah. yeah. So that's, you know, and that's what people, yeah, oh, I remember that. You know, wait, come LRA, I remember that part. You know. <laughs> yeah, so. But when that was happening, I was whatever, I, I thought maybe a year away, but it was two years away from finishing the book, and I thought, damn, you know, this would be good if I could, this would be out now, because <clears throat> someone kind of has heard the name, Coney. Yeah. So how many of the 30 girls have this, or So yeah. all, um, well, four died in captivity, mm -hmm. and all other 26 um, returned. Um, the last one, because this was in 1996, the last one returned after 12 years. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how old were they when they were adopted? They were between, I mean, some were, some that had been taken from St. Mary's were, I think the youngest was maybe 10, mm -hmm. 10 to 16. Mm -hmm. But when the girls were selected, they chose sort of, I think, kind of. 13 to 14, 15 year olds, stronger looking ones, and those are the mm -hmm. broken girls. Mm -hmm. Yes? You started your next book? <laughs> <laughs> I have. <laughs> um, but I've actually started three other books. 
Great. And that was another thing I was doing while I was writing this one. I think every once in a while I just needed a break from it myself, from the material. So I started, yeah, three other books <laughs> in various stages of. So which one of those should I, you know, <laughs> am I going to do? But, yeah. I haven't been doing a lot of writing lately, though. Probably have time for one more question. Can I ask? Yeah. Was Charlotte one who was returned? Did she? Yes. Get to be yes. She 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 <laughs> returned. Um, she had two children with her, two sons. I haven't been in touch with her since. So I was waiting till I finished the book to, um, yeah, I haven't sent her a book yet. I'll be grateful for what you've done. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's true. You say you won't, the characters won't leave your mind and the real figures won't leave your mind. I think it's weird that we all right. feel the same way. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Are there a, is there another question from the audience? Oh, one more. Is it going to be a movie? <laughs> you know what? People always love this, but it, it actually is being optioned cool. um, by Rachel Weiss, and she wants me to write the screenplay, and she wants to play James. You must be very happy about that. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Susan. Thank you all.